Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Colin McGuire of Mag 10 Knife Works. Colin is a knife smith and maker out of Rhode Island who works in foraging and stock removal to create beautiful, one-of-a-kind EDC, kitchen, and field knives. His EDW model caught my eye sometime this past year when Javon's Knife Flicks began featuring it numerous, uh, numerous times in his YouTube videos and Instagram posts. I was excited to spot the knife when I came across the Mag 10 table at Blade Show. And after bending Colin's ear about his work for a few minutes, I knew I wanted to find out more. We'll do just that. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And be sure to download the show to your favorite podcast app. And if you'd like to help support the show, you can do so by going over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon and checking out what we have to offer. Again, that is thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Adventure Delivered, your monthly subscription for hand-picked outdoor, survival, EDC, and other cool gear from our expert team of outdoor professionals. TheKnifeJunkie.com slash BattleBox. Colin, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, sir. Ah, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, uh, actually, two different uh, ways. I, I, know, I know you through two different people, Javon's Knife Flicks, who shows off that EDW an awful lot. And then I know you personally through Matt Chase. Yep. Uh, we, we're both buddies with him. And that was cool to find out kind of randomly. Um, uh, before we get into uh, you as a knife maker and stuff, uh, let's talk about Blade Show for a second. Um, how, was that your first show or have you, do you go every year? What, how was no, that? No, I, I go every year. Yeah. I've, uh, I've exhibited every year since, uh, 2019 with the notable exception of 2020, of course. So. Got you. All right. Well, how was it this year? Was it, was it cool? It was a pretty crowded room in there. It was, it was, uh, it was a little bit off. I think, I think a lot of guys had the same experience. Um, I don't know if it's just the economy, you know, or if I just brought the wrong stuff, I did. Okay. But uh, it was probably my worst year since 2019. Hmm. That's uh, actually we have heard that uh, people talking about it on this show the past couple of weeks have have said uh, similar things. To me, it seemed like there were a lot of people there. Uh, but oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, maybe maybe uh, maybe not spending as freely as they had in the past. <clears throat> that that was the vibe I got for sure. You know, it uh, the the crowd was great, um, but it just the the sales weren't there. Um, which is, you know, it's blade show. Sometimes you hit, sometimes you don't. Um, it's something we kind of treat as a, uh, as a vacation. My wife and I, we, uh, we go down with some, uh, make or a couple of our, uh, friends of ours that are, you know, very good friends. And we kind of make a vacation of it every year. And, you know, don't get me wrong. Like, obviously I want to make money at blade, but yeah. it's not the only and most important thing, you know, when it, when it comes to that time. Yeah. Uh, for some, uh, like myself, and I'm sure many, many knife makers, it's the only time out of the year that I get to uh, actually say hi face to face to friends I've made uh, in the knife world uh, over the past year. So I, I value right. it for that, for sure. <clears throat> and of course, I spend more than I should. But hey, you know, that's that's what it's about. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it is what it is. So. All right. So before we move on uh, from Blade Show, if you could have gotten anything there, I'm not sure how much time you had to walk around and check out work, but was there anything there that caught your eye? Unfortunately, you're you're probably not going to like this answer. Um, not really. And not because there wasn't a ton of stuff there that I, I would have liked, but I actually I don't get a lot of opportunity to walk around. I'm uh, I'm kind of table bound the entire time. And, um, you know, I, I guess. I'm a huge fan of, uh, you know, Sparrow Knife Co. and Kenison, which are like right next to me. So someday I would like to, you know, own a piece from from both of them. And I guess that would be my answer for you. Um, but as far as like, I didn't, I literally didn't make it into the big room even once this year. So I, uh, I, I the the irony is that I don't get to see a lot of it. You know, I'm I'm busy just trying to trying to do my thing and and make some money. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Let the, let the crowd come to you. Well, uh, as I mentioned up front, you, you 
uh, make a variety of knives, uh, kitchen knives, EDC type knives, field knives. How did you get into this and uh, how did you get into <clears throat> making them? Uh, so kind of a funny story. Um, you know, I've been doing this about 10 years, uh, eight and a half years full time. And uh, prior to me becoming a bladesmith, I didn't really know this world even existed, uh, which I know sounds really weird. Um, I was a mechanic in a former life, uh, dealership guy, engine specialist. I uh, spent most of my adult life doing that, went to, uh, to trade school right out of high school. And I was, uh, I was at a dealership by the time I was 20. Um, hmm. For a, a time reference that predates 9-11. I watched that happen in the, the waiting room of my dealership. And uh, I was kind of at a transitional time in my life. Like at, at the time, though I'm now, you know, happily married with two children, I was unattached, kind of, you know, bored with the dealership thing. I had been doing it a long time. Uh, you know, that life isn't the best either, you know, and um, was just kind of bored and, uh, you know, had always carried knives throughout my life as, you know, a tradesman, you know, never mm -hmm. had like a, a Kershaw in my pocket that I got off, you know, the, the snap on truck or whatever. And, uh, I was just kind of bored and was like, Hey, I wonder if I could make a knife. Uh, once again, not really realizing that the entire world of custom knife making existed. I was just kind of messing around and, uh, you know, I got some angle iron from home Depot and, uh, <laughs> you know, a crappy grinder and just started kind of going at it in, uh, my apartment at the time which was you know, completely tile floors, wall to wall. And I was just sitting there grinding out these really, really crappy knife-like objects and, uh, you know, passing the time, keeping myself entertained. And that kind of led down a rabbit hole where I, I realized, you know, that people actually do this for a living and well. <laughs> and, um, you know, at, at the time, I didn't have a lot of responsibility and I was just like, screw it, we're going to make knives. And uh, mm. I just like kind of dove in and, you know, 10 years later, here I am having this conversation with you. Well, I, I want to ask you how you went from crappy grinders and angle irons to uh, what you're making now. But a uh, couple of things first, um, you did, you've mentioned a couple of times about how when you started knife making, you were unattached, you had no responsibilities, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, do, are, are you are you implying or maybe you're not implying anything, but are you implying that uh, this would be a difficult uh, road to hoe if you oh. were if you were going into it in your current married? Oh, state? I could never make the same decision uh, that I did at the time. I was just like, screw it. I'm going to make knives and see how it goes. And uh, I would right. never, you know, with a family to support and uh, yeah. the responsibility I have in my life now, I would I wouldn't dream of, you know pursuing something like that so it was absolutely it was a, a definitely a, a circumstance that was perfect and maybe i kind of recognized that you know not a lot of people get the opportunity to to just like throw themselves at something with yeah. reckless abandon like i did and uh so that's what i did and uh you know like i said the, here we are so I, I saw your tattoo on your i guess it's your left hand hemi uh yeah. yeah pretty pretty devoted to uh to the the craft and the cars <clears throat> and the me and and being a mechanic how how did that how did those skills there uh where i don't think you're actually making stuff you're fixing no. stuff right right how, but but still you know obviously handy as hell and know yeah. your way around tools how did those skills translate and help you when you uh, moved into knife making well, I think you just kind of, you know, hit the nail on the head, so to speak, um, in that it, there's no bleed over artistically or anything like that. But when I was like, hey, I'm going to try and make a knife, like I wasn't scared of the process, you know, uh, obviously I wasn't using fire at the time, but, you know, it, had I been, you know, I've been holding an oxyacetylene torch my entire life and, you know, uh, tools and steel, like it just, it wasn't an intimidating prospect. You know, right. it's just like, whatever. It's like, just grind, grind some metal away. How hard that could that be? You know? And uh, yeah. so it was, like I said, there's no artistic bleed over, but it was, it, it took away any like fear of the process, you know, in fact, probably more so than it should have, because uh, like I said, my first knife shop was in a, a third floor apartment in uh, Providence. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I was, it was a quite an endeavor to clean once I finally left because I wanted to make sure I left the place in you know as good or better condition than I uh, 
then I found it. And uh, the the process of like dust removal <laughs> from a, yeah, a, sure. a three bedroom apartment was somewhat, you know, daunting and, uh, you know, time consuming. So, but like I said, I was like, literally, I'm just going to make knives in this apartment and it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. So here we are. You got to get your, uh, got to get that deposit back. Uh, in the apartment days, how are you heat treating? At the time I wasn't because I, uh, that was in my angle iron phase. Um, the very first knives that I actually heat treated, I, uh, I did so in a rigged up, uh, forge that was made out of a charcoal grill with a blower on the bottom of it. Okay. And, uh, you know, can of canola oil about as, about as crude as you could possibly get and as far away from, you know, my computer controlled even heat as you could possibly be. <laughs> right. It's sort of the uh, post-apocalyptic way of, of making yeah. a knife. Well, uh, oh geez, I hope not. <laughs> uh, well, so how did you go from angle iron in your apartment to, uh, as I mentioned up front, I've seen some really beautiful forged pieces from you. Thank you. So, so what was the, what was the path <clears throat> that you start going into forging first? Yeah. So once I realized that, you know, what I was making were not knives, they were simply knife-like objects, uh, that, you know, led to me recovering, you know, leaf springs from local junkyard and, uh, you know, heat treating them in that, that charcoal, you know, grill forge. Um, and then one thing led to another and, you know, constructing a little fire brick forge and uh, just kind of enjoying the process of, of hitting steel with a hammer. Um, albeit very crudely and, you know, terribly at the time. Um, so yeah, I just, I started my very, the first couple of years I was just reclaiming leaf springs and, you know, I was doing a little bit of forge. I was basically like flattening them out and getting them straight in the, the little fire brick forge and getting them heat treated and, you know, selling them at gun shows, uh, you know, oh, just yeah. these little like hundred dollar EDC paracord wrap, you know, with these terrible, like low scandy grinds on them. And somehow people found them endearing and, uh, you know, that kind of kept me going for a while. And next thing you know, endearing. you know, I'm, I'm, yeah. Uh, you know, once again, I, I, I don't want to speak poorly of them because obviously people were willing to give me money for them. And had they not been, we wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation. And it's something I'm eternally grateful for, uh, you know. And so, but I mean, objectively, they were pretty terrible. <laughs> with yeah, well, and, and it's also incumbent upon the maker to look at his older work and 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 see all of its faults. I know exactly uh, what those early knives look like because you have a, a picture of it on your website uh, of oh, one no. of the early ones. I, I believe yeah. you do, um, and it looked. Cool. It looked like I, I knew you. immediately that it was your yeah. first knife or, yeah. or an, an early one because yeah. all you have to do is look at your current ones. Right. Um, but but yeah, from an outsider's perspective, that's cool. That's a bit of history uh, yeah. from a maker that I uh, whose work I really like um, as opposed to look as opposed to you looking at your own work saying, oh, my God, that's embarrassing. Look at how I've grown. Um, I, I think it's interesting that you say uh, people found them endearing. Uh, because I, I know what you mean. It's not endearing like, oh, he's making knives. I'm going to buy one from him. Yeah. It's like the, the piece itself is like, this is this is useful. And it shows yeah. like someone's actual hand, you know, yeah. I think I mean, I'm I'm known for my I don't want to phrase this improperly, but my salesmanship, I don't want mm -hmm. that to come across like, you know, I'm just a salesman, but I, I'm known for being like pretty high energy at shows and, you know, very, very engaging. Like I'm the kind of guy, if you walk by my table, like you don't want to make eye contact or I'm going to talk to you. <laughs> I think and, that's how this, I think that's how you got me. I think I walked by yeah. and you're like, Hey, <laughs> and <I'm> like, what? <laughs> so like I, that once again, I mean, they were useful, but I think a lot of it too was like my enthusiasm for them. And like, I was at the time I was like, so proud of myself. And I think the the fact that I hadn't been so involved in this world for so long was a, a benefit to me because like I didn't I didn't know what I didn't know. And like I was just so pumped to like that someone would be even entertaining the thought of giving me money for this like, you know, little tiny piece of leaf spring that I like crudely hammered out and, you know, put a a very like 
like I said, low scandy grind with a one by 30 grinder from Harbor Freight. And I was just like so pumped that someone would be willing to even look at them, you know, that yeah. when I think even for the first few years, I still wasn't like really following the the business, you know, so I wasn't like seeing all the spectacular work just like flooding my way and kind of telling me that what I was doing wasn't terribly good. Oh, God. Yeah, that's those are some <laughs> early pieces. Oh, God. I'm, yeah, I'm I'm wow. You know, it's funny that you're bringing up the website. I basically keep that around because I have the domain. And like whatever I I pay for it, which is yeah, not yeah, insignificant, yeah. but I'm like someday I'm gonna revamp it. That website has not been touched in like eight years. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You can tell so just, just by looking at at your yeah. Instagram I'm warning feed. everyone. Like, you know, <laughs> Instagram you can, seems to be where you have the most yeah. current stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's that's become my you know my collection of work, and so like so much so that like the website's not on my business card. So oh. I guess you know now that it's out there, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, there you go. It's a if, little, if anyone, little reminder from the yeah. If anyone, podcast. I mean, it, it can be fun if you're familiar with my current work and like want to see, you know, how much I've progressed in say the last eight years. Then it's an interesting little trip down memory lane, if you will. But I'm like, oof, oh god, <laughs> like he just showed that. Um, uh, so let, let me ask you a question. You, you've mentioned Leaf Spring a couple of times, and I know um, a lot of uh, like, for instance, some of the Filipino swords behind me were were reclaimed uh, truck springs and stuff like that. And I've heard uh, and read in places where, uh, depending on how long that truck or car, or whatever that is with a leaf spring, I guess it's a truck. Uh, however, you know, if it's been on the road a long time, it could be weakened or um what do you call it compromised steel did you ever in your experience when you were doing that you know gra go into the junkyard and grabbing leaf spring ever have that happen uh never never to anything i made with it mm -hmm. i mean like obviously like as you're scouring the junkyard for good finds you'll see springs that have broken you know the spring near the spring perch or have been over you know weighted and and stressed over time and have given way in their you know, current form as a leaf spring. Uh, but I've never seen, never had any issues with, uh, you know, cracks or stress or anything, you know, that was something I'd made from them. Uh, this is not in, you know, in any way me advocating for doing that. Sure. I'm just sure. saying like, I had never experienced any issues, you know, and all I knew is they got hard. And that was what was most important to me at the time, you know, was just making something that would kind of cut, you know, so uh, how, how did you get your first forge? Did you make it? And did anyone show you what to do? No, no. I, uh, you know, I, like I said, my very first one was kind of constructed out of fire bricks and uh, map gas torches. I basically constructed like a fire brick square, you know, with uh, mm -hmm. two 45 degree uh, holes drilled in it that I could stick two map gas torches in and kind of get like a tumbling flame front in the center of the, the brick structure. And I could get two or three inches of steel, you know, hot in that thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, I moved on to uh, a chili forge, one of their single burner Venturis. And uh, eventually like the piece I use now, which I've been beating on for years is basically a copy of the one at Dragon's Breath in Walcott, Connecticut. Uh, the one that Matt and Jamie use, it was built for me by a buddy who was, you know, uh, you know, kind of working out of there at the time. And uh, I traded him a knife for, you know, building me a replica of their forge, which I was at that time I had become, you know, very comfortable using and, you know, very decent at uh, controlling. So that's what I run now. It's just a old propane tank with a giant like 475 CFM uh, bouncy house blower that I have to regulate down with a ball valve or else it'll melt stuff. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, I, okay. So I, I have dreams of foraging at some point when, when I'm not in the constricted suburbs and, yeah. you know, at some point I'd like to, as a hobbyist, uh, how, how did you learn what you were doing? I mean, I know you, you've seen forge and fire, what, not then you didn't. Yeah. I mean, this is long before that, but I mean, you've seen people do it. You know, you have an impression. My my impression a long time ago was that Conan the Barbarian just pouring steel into a mold, you know. Right. So how did you kind of figure out what you were doing and start making these Damascus steels and such? Uh, trial and error. <laughs> yeah, I uh, don't get me wrong. I'm I'm 
very blessed to be surrounded by some of the most talented blade and swordsmiths in the world. You know, I'm in New England and we have a really, really strong yeah. contingent of once again, like world-class bladesmiths here. And uh, they're my friends and I've known them for a long time now. And uh, so I'm, I'm fortunate enough where amongst that giant pool of friends, there's, there's not a lot I can't figure out with a phone call if I need to. But uh, initially, it was just kind of trial and error, just getting steel hot, hitting it with a hammer and seeing where it moved and then kind of figuring out how, you know, I could use that experience that I was gaining over time to to push steel in the right direction and, and make knives. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm I'm definitely like a, a, a hard headed trial and error type guy. And that's been most of my knife making career has just been like do it until it works you know yeah like so. uh um like learning the hard way leaves a deeper impression sometimes um, yeah and then being told by someone who knows i mean both both are helpful for sure yeah no and i i don't necessarily advocate the way i did it you know mm -hmm. uh there are so many talented people out there offering just amazing classwork um, that I encourage anyone to, to go and take a class, you know, learn from someone who knows what they're doing versus like, you know, kind of fumbling your way through it. Like I did for so long. Well, um, let's, let's see one of your knives and we've been talking about them. I realize uh, we've only seen Instagram pictures and I know you have a couple uh, sitting close by. Yeah, I got a few. Um, this is kind of one of my recent pieces right here. Oh, that is, whoa. Tell me about that Damascus. Wow. So this is a, a four bar composite piece. Um, the two center bars are uh, what I call a Turkish firestorm. It's kind of applying the same principle of Turkish twist, but to firestorm, which is a twisted crush W. So the two center bars, I don't know how well that's coming through. Yeah. Are, hold, it, uh, hold it still for a sec. I can see those center. That center bar is so cool. It's got this yeah. tight, uh, pattern tight wavy pattern that follows the contour of the edge and then you've got this much looser pattern on on yeah. the edge and the spine what is that so the outer two bars are actually the two halves of a feather pattern so wow. instead of welding the feather back together with the seam i simply stuck it on the outside of the two center bars which like i said it's a, a right hand and a left hand firestorm twist so it's just a four bar composite. I'm, I hadn't seen anyone do it before. I'm sure, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. So I'm sure someone at some point had gone, hey, like, why don't I twist these two pieces of firestorm in opposite directions and, you know, take a feather and not weld it back together, but weld it to the outside or something like that, you know. But uh, that's the kind of stuff that I like doing, just kind of coming up with something that's a little bit irregular, you know, yeah. and uh, not necessarily like reinventing the wheel. Like, you know, obviously firestorms a thing and feathers a thing, <laughs> but uh, kind of putting them together and just making something cool and new with it, you know, hold, hold that up again, if you would, and, and hold it still. And I want to I want to see. Man, that blade is beautiful. Now, your handle is really cool, too. Uh, it it's a what do you call it? Like a letterbox or or whatever uh, the, the, the shadow tang, box yeah shadow box yeah thank you the tang stands proud of the scales but you have six scales here um, yeah which is really cool tell tell me about this design and and what its intention is uh you know its intention is just to be cool um there's no <laughs> i know like i i i hope that's not like a disappointment you know no. but uh it's kind of art for art's sake I, and i use that term loosely like I, I don't know really where i fall on the you're an artist or you're not an artist type of thing um but i found that though i never thought it would happen my mind more recently and i'm still doing a ton of you know my edws which ironically i don't have any to show off today um but i'm still doing a ton of my you know standard fair stuff but my mind is starting to work in ways that i didn't anticipate it would a little while ago you know, I used to look at art knives and go, oh, like, why would you do that? It's a knife. Why would you hyper embellish it to the point of making it not non-functional, but mm -hmm. make it, you know, just a collector's item. Right. And then something in my brain kind of clicked over the last couple of years, maybe. And um, like all of a sudden I'm starting to look at texture and color and, and like all these different 
aspects that I didn't ever think I would want to incorporate in, you know, my work. Uh, geometries, you know, like for instance, the the shape of the the segmented scales on that piece, you know, just even like where I segmented them, you know, the the middle piece is a essentially like an inverted trapezoid. I don't know if I can show, but yeah. like even where the the segments were arranged, it was kind of just done intentionally to be cool and different, and I don't know, almost maybe like Art Deco ish. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the funny thing is, is looking at that knife, it it it's it's such a functional looking design. Yeah. Uh, and and you say, you know, uh, my intention was to make it cool. Well, uh, you know, mission accomplished. But it also Thank looks you. like a uh, yeah, absolutely. It also looks like a very usable knife, and and something that uh, it it looks like it's in about the the size range I carry kind of on a daily basis yep. in my in my waistband. So it looks extremely useful. And oh, it would a, be, you know. As a as, no 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 as a sidebar, yep. Uh, my definition uh, when we talk about art is that art is something that can only be appreciated, but not used the way a knife can be used. Uh, right. So so I would say uh, you're a very talented knife maker who approaches knife making in an artistic way. And the only reason I'm I'm laying that out is this is an, kind of an argument I've had with several people over many many years. I'm and sure so that's my definition. Yeah, no, and I, I actually, I like that quite a bit um, because as I mentioned before, like I'm not sure like where I fall on that whole argument because it is one that's come up, you know, quite a bit recently. And it's like, I just like making cool stuff. And mm -hmm. I guess I never, I never thought of myself, like I could never have imagined making something and maybe this isn't a good example either because it's not necessarily a function following form thing, you know, as you picked out, it's a incredibly functional knife and it, it wasn't made so crazily that, you know, it, it wouldn't serve its purpose well, but you know, like I said, the segmented handles, like, is there a purpose behind it? No, it's just to be cool. And it's to be different. Like, you know, kind of pick myself out of a crowd and do something that I haven't seen anyone else doing you know, which yeah. I think is really, really important, uh, especially right now with, you know, so many makers out there doing, yeah. you know, similar stuff, like, you know, just trying to do something that, like I said, I think is cool that I'm hoping other people find is cool. And at the same time, you know, doesn't take away from the, the actual utility of the knife. Well, you know, definitely spending a lot of time embellishing it, you know, for sheer embellishment sake, if you know, well, that, that trapezoid in the center of that handle, um, you know, it's not just a cool embellishment because you could have put it upside down and it would be it would be half as useful in in terms of traction. But the way yeah. those lines are splayed out in this direction, um, it's it's both artful and useful. And uh, and, you know, you're probably maybe not even seeing some of those things because you're approaching it like I've never seen this before. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, that's that's. So uh, is that a part of is that a knife model that you make along with knives like the EDW or ones that you make a little more pedestrian? Yes, actually. So it's a, a slightly <laughs> scaled up version of my EDP or everyday Persian. Um, and I'm, as you can tell by my, uh, my naming <laughs> uh, <laughs> trend weird. here, that's the one thing I've never been super creative about, you know? Um, but it's just a, a scaled up version of my EDP uh, into what I would consider a more like full size version. Um, my EDP is, you know, roughly the same size as the size as the EDW in that it's what I would consider for most hands to be like a three and a half finger knife, um, okay. in that they're, you know, smallish fixed blades where your pinky is kind of grasping the pommel area, mm -hmm. uh, giving you some traction there, but also, you know, they're, they're EDC fixed blades. So footprint is obviously an important thing to take mm -hmm. into mind, you know, when you're designing. So all of those knives have a, a similar like handle shape and the, you know, thought process behind it. And it's one that's been, you know, born out over time and, and proven again and again is, you know, if you have a, a hand that's on the smaller side size, you can choke up on it and get a full four finger grip. Mm -hmm. But for most guys, it's going to be a three and a half finger knife where your pinky is, like I said, kind of falling behind it, but at the same yeah. time you're getting a purchase on the pommel. So you've got that control and you're, you know, whatnot. That uh, three and a half, <laughs> finger dynamic or that that three and a half finger grip can be a very comfortable thing because uh you know some of the pressure 
some of the backward pressure uh, goes into the pinky instead of the, if you had something real short, it'd be going into the palm, but instead right. it's going into the pinky and that's a real secure uh, grip. I like, I like that too. Um, because I'm a daily uh, carry uh, fix, fixed blade guy. I like that. I also like a right. rounded handle a lot of the time, not everything, uh, but I like a rounded handle because you know, I'm not as slender as I used to be, not as slender as I'd want to be. And I don't like that poke, you know? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's little things like that that I've just learned over time, um, you know, through, once again, kind of trial and error and just doing it over and over again. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, like I said, the, the piece I just showed you is just a, a way scaled up version of of one of my absolute, you know, staple pieces, which is the EDP. Um probably been my most popular knife over the last four or five years it's been in my inventory for quite a while and um yeah i just i had a, a cool idea for a pattern and you know wanted to scale it up a bit and just do something crazy with the handle and that's kind of what i came up with so when you first started forging or or first got very serious and you were out of the apartment and using real steel and heat treating and everything what was your first model that hit and, and what was it like and uh what did people why were people attracted to it? I, I ironically, it was as far as like I was still doing initially just a whole bunch of different stuff, you know, like little drop points and you know some trailing points and little buoys and stuff. But it actually was maybe it's been longer than four or five years now. But that that EDP was the first one that really really took off for me, and it's one that I'm like literally working on two of like as we speak. You know, I've got them in the shop right now, getting ready for, you know, my next show in a week and a half. So, uh, you know, I'm still to this day, you know, trying to keep at least two or three of them on the table at any given time because they haven't, they haven't showed any sign of, you know, losing any popularity. So it's, uh, that EVP man, it's, it's been very good to me. Well, how, how does it work for you in terms of, um, well, the actual work part, you're a full-time knife maker. Um, uh, you, forge an awful lot are you yep. doing stock reduction i said up front you were but yep okay so yeah, how does my how does that work into your it, it's honestly you know i'm still a very very show centric business okay. um so uh, right now is my arts and craft show season um i was in new hampshire two and a half weeks ago i was in new hampshire the past weekend that just went by, I'll be down on Cape Cod a week and a half from now. And so it kind of just, uh, right now it looks like plugging holes in the inventory, if that makes sense. Like trying to have a little bit of everything on the table at any given time. And, uh, you know, when I come back from the show, I just kind of take note of what's missing and what I need to replace. And uh, if that means stainless, then it's probably going to be stock removal. If I've got some Damascus gaps, then it means I'm going to be forging. And uh, it kind of, it's very much just like, all right, what are we doing? I don't know. Let's figure it out. You know, um, there's very little regiment to my like life when it comes to like, don't get me wrong. Like every, every piece I make follows the same basic, you know, build characteristics with the exception of maybe, you know, forging it or not forging it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, like I said, what I'm, what I'm doing any given week, you know, is just kind of depending on like what went um, the, the weekend before, you know? So that's, that's interesting. Like I, I, I hear a lot about uh, uh, from knife makers who, forge and that's kind of their their real passion and where the oh, yeah. where the real uh work and play happens and yep. then to make ends meet uh make uh batches of stock reduction knives and and uh, due to kind of a, a a quicker process but i'm not hearing yep. that from you i'm hearing it's more like uh, well, people are, are more into the damascus right now because uh, they bought more of those i have to do some forging or yep. uh that's interesting so you keep kind of an like you said, an inventory, uh, and oh, that's interesting. Yeah, this is the and, first. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, there's going to be a certain amount of like tailoring I do to like the crowd I'm going to see. Like, obviously, if I'm going to like a big knife show, is you know somewhere where people are not only appreciative of the Damascus stuff, and don't get me wrong, like everyone's appreciative of it. But yeah. you know, am I necessarily expecting to be selling like six hundred dollar EDCs at you know an arts and craft show? Not really. Right. 
So I'm going to be focusing more on, you know, my stock removal stuff. Um, you know, even trying to have some like really not low buck, but what I consider my like entry level stuff on the table, because, you know, people are not so scared of approaching something that's, you know, $200 or below versus once again, you know, like what showing up at like a field in Cape Cod with a bunch of thousand dollar knives, like yeah. you're probably not going to do too well, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that being said, you know, like I, I actually did quite well with them, uh, you know, last weekend, surprisingly enough. And so like, there are some holes in the inventory there that need to be filled now. So um, who's, who's buying them? Uh, it's interesting <laughs> because you, you do a lot of face to face sales. I do. Um, uh, so who are the, like, if you could generalize or like, you know, what, what are your observations about your customers? Dude, it's everyone. Um, and I know that sounds weird, but it's probably because I, I kind of approach my business in an not odd fashion, but in a unique one. Whereas like, I really don't know anyone else who's like willing to go set up in an arts and craft show. Well, that's not true. I, I know a couple, but like where my schedule during the summer is, you know, mostly that. Um, so for the arts and crafts crowd, like if I'm up in New Hampshire, like I was last weekend, I'm definitely going to encounter some hunters. And so my EDP, uh, once again, getting back to that, like that kind of has been my hunting crowd go to just because of like the trailing point and the size. It actually, while I wasn't necessarily designing it initially to be uh you know a skinning knife it turns out that it was brought to my attention that it is yeah. a wonderful skinning knife and so like for that crowd i'm gonna have a few of those on hand um chef knives which are not my favorite thing to make um are really popular with that crowd because i'll you know i sell plenty of those to you know both male and female customers but like i my chef knives usually end up going the ones that aren't commission pieces, you know, end up going to, you know, like middle-aged moms who kind of just like run across me at an arts and craft show. And they're like, Oh, wow, this is beautiful. And it's light. And I've, I've never held a custom chef knife before. And I didn't realize that they could be this thin and light and, you know, like dicey. And, yeah. uh, and you you're know, such so, a nice young man. <laughs> and I'm such a nice young man. I just, I bring them right in, you know, like, well, you know what I'm so. thinking about? Like the arts and craft shows, I could see how, oh my God, you're a light at the end of the tunnel for the man yes. whose wife is like, we're going this weekend to the arts and craft. Oh, really? Yeah. Like, know? I hope I'm not giving my game away here. And <laughs> like, the next thing you know, like I'm going to have all this, this arts and crafts competition. Yeah. But that, that very much is, you know, my, my kind of target demographic mm -hmm. at the, uh, at the arts and craft show, you know, um, Guy's getting dragged around by his wife. She just spent four hundred dollars on like you know cheese graters and birdhouses and candles. And uh, you know, he he's he's already bored. He's watched her spend a bunch of money, and he's like, "Hey, man, like I did not expect you to be here, and I'm very happy you are. And yeah. you know what? I think I'll take that. Yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm gonna pay you for your time and your knives. Yeah. So, <laughs> pardon me. Uh, you right before we started rolling, you held held up a chef's knife. And since we were just talking about those, uh, can you hold that up? Let's let's take a look. Yeah. Ooh, in a sheath. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, got a drawer sleeve with a snap close. You know, safety first. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is just one of my seven inch chefs. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, this one's in a CPM one fifty four uh, with some three K carbon weave. Let me see if I can get that. Sorry, I'm terrible at this. That's all right. 3K carbon fiber weave scales, uh, gray G10 liners, extruded carbon fiber pins. Just uh, oh, nice. Yeah, about a two and an eighth at the at the heel, uh, about a hundred thou at the spine, uh, full distal taper, and uh, she's light and fast. You know. So you were saying, first of all, that is beautiful. I really like you. the. Uh, you're welcome. I really like that sort of finger groove at the at the Ricasso there, yeah. or, you know, at the base of the handle, you really choke up on that with your yep. middle finger and, and be, yeah. That's, that's kind of, you know, what it's there for is to get that middle finger up into that palm swell as mm -hmm. you're, you know, pinch gripping it. So. So you said they're not your favorite to make. What, why? And I mean, people very much enjoy them. So I'm, I'm, quite good at them i think um at least according to my customer base and you know my wife who uses them um it's there's not a lot of room for craziness if you will like you can definitely 
you see my design language in my chef knives in that they're, as I would describe them, like racy, you know, kind of like uh, I, kind of harkening back to my, my automotive background. Uh, I, I draw a lot of inspiration from car design, I guess. Um, you might not know that initially by looking at my work, but if you were to take the profile and, you know, black everything out and like just look at its silhouette in the dark, you know, I'm kind of drawing inspiration from, um, even though I was a muscle car guy, I, I very much like the lines of Italian cars, uh, you, you yeah, know? And yeah. so that's kind of, while you might not know it if I didn't tell you that, um, that very much is influential in the way I, I set up my profiles and like the way curves and lines intersect with each other. You know, I'm kind of, kind of looking at like an Aventador in the dark. Yeah. You know what I mean? And trying to, while not like replicate that, I'm, that's the, the design language I'm kind of using. And so my chef knife is very like racy, if you will. And you might see it in the profile now that I've pointed that out. So it's distinctly mine, um, but there's not a whole lot of room for like craziness. Like there are certain things it has to do. Uh, and I mean, that's, that's true with any knife, of course, but especially with chef knives. Um, so mostly, you know, like I, because of the the demographics I'm I'm catering to with my chef knives in general being you know the arts and crafts crowd you know like thousand dollar Damascus pieces aren't you know what I get a lot of opportunity to do so most of them are following a very very similar kind of uh, recipe as that piece right there um, and every once in a while I'll change a curve or I'll you know update my chef knife design and it'll evolve you know as yeah. as all our stuff does but it is still. A pretty tried and true you know formula and recipe and you know it's a, a lot of grinding and a yeah. lot of hand standing and you know not a lot of like leeway for being crazy so that's that's why like i said i i, I very much enjoy using the knives i make um you know there there's something incredibly satisfying like when, when the off the rare occasion when i help my wife make dinner and you know i get to use one of my own pieces in the kitchen you know it's it's incredibly satisfying to do um like, but damn yeah good. But, yeah oh yeah it's it's uh, you know just affirming <laughs> you know what yeah. i mean like what yeah. i i already intuitively knew but um like i said they're they're a lot of grinding and a lot of hand sanding and that's, not a lot of craziness that's what i was gonna say about uh right you know, from an outsider's perspective a non-knife maker's perspective i have uh three custom kitchen knives all from the same maker that are so thin so beautifully done and I look at them and I think, wow, this seems really hard to do because you got to get them really thin, yep. <clears throat> excuse me, and flat, you know, flat ground, full flat ground, really thin. And it seems like you could do an awful lot of work on it on heat treated steel. I think you have to probably heat treat yep. it first since yep. you're going so thin. And then you could just kind of go too thin and burn through it. Or it seems like so much could go wrong with a chef's knife. Is that it? Do you think there's a skill barrier to entry in making chef knives? Yes and no. Um, like, don't get me wrong. Like, you can, short of like burning through it, like, there's a lot of correction that could be made, you know, or maybe, maybe I just don't really think about it. And maybe I'm, maybe by the time I started doing chef knives, I was decent enough at it where mm. it didn't seem super challenging. You know what I mean? Um, don't get me wrong. Like I said, there is like, you're, you're definitely paying attention and you're paying attention for a, a far longer amount of time than normal uh, on the grinder. Cause as you mentioned, you know, you're at least the way I approach my chef knives, you know, I'm, I'm heat treating at full thickness. So I've got, you know, in the case of uh, a seven or eight inch chef knife, I've got a lot of material to remove, you know, mm -hmm. post heat treat. And it's, you know, hard. I've, you know, hard, you know, 154 CM or CPM 154 CM. And uh, so it's, it's a few hours of like grinding, you know, followed by a f quite a few hours of hand standing as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I haven't found them. I'm paying a lot of attention, but I, I wouldn't say they're necessarily super difficult, at least for me, you know, your, your, your results may vary. <laughs> so well, I mean, I, I, I just, it's totally changed, uh, 
I, I, I just wish I cooked more. <laughs> I, I, I do the functional cooking, keeping the family alive during the week. And my wife does all the glamorous <laughs> cooking on the weekend, you know, all the stuff. Oh, this is so good. <clears throat> um, but I, I use the knives a lot. Uh, and, and man, uh, having a custom handmade kitchen knife has, has totally changed it up in the kitchen for me. Like yeah. my Vostov Trident, uh, which I still prize because of, uh, for sentimental reasons, I never use it, you know? Right. Uh, Cause it's like, it feels like an ax or a wedge, you know? Well, and that's, that's the selling point. I think that, you know, when someone stumbles across me, you know, uh, uh, unexpectedly from their perspective, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. finding me at this arts and craft show and they, they pick one up. I, I don't, know what they weigh because i haven't you know put them on a scale but they're they're not heavy you know like i said you know we're talking about you know hundred thousands at the spine uh and so they that's the first thing that they always they always notice is the weight or lack thereof rather and so you know yeah uh i want to ask you talk a little bit about the business of being a knife maker but before we do do you have anything else in front of you uh to show off or is it those two knives you have i know a lot of people you make them you sell them you know you don't keep them around but yeah that's basically what i have with me right now i it's funny like i had a, a really good show last weekend and so right. i'm i'm lacking in a lot of the the staples if you will you know yeah. what i mean the uh which like i said i'm literally in the process of, of replacing as we speak well not well, as I... we speak i'm talking to you but <laughs> as uh but before we get to the business i have to say the edw which is uh similar to the the version you showed which is a large looks like a large version of the edp kind of a similar right. handle but a worn clip blade that thing is awesome i've i've oh, seen it you. in a number of places uh javon is the only one i can remember he's the one who introduced me to to that knife but uh it's a it's a very cool knife and uh that blade is beautiful uh what do you, what do you find uh is your most uh popular blade shape what do people out there uh, who are buying from you like the most? <laughs> well, right now it, it's the EDW. It's the um, okay. that I kind of introduced that at the New York Custom Show last year. Hmm. So, and the first one I did was actually not it. It of course resembled you know what the model has become. Um, but the first one I did for the New York show last year was uh, one of my shadow box pieces. It was a uh, four. I think I forget what the pattern was, but it was a pretty elaborate. It might have just been a four bar Turkish twist with some, you know, shadow box, you know, fat carbon scales. And uh, it was a little swoopier than the little more accentuated, if you will, or a little more, a little less reserved. Like, obviously, the, the model it's become is in no way like tame or, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. like subdued. But uh, the first one was even more slightly different proportions and it was just kind of like a, a swoopier version of, of what it has become and uh people actually just really dug it and uh, i really dug it and so i was like let me just try and you know work this into my inventory in general and that's kind of what i did and never looked back because it's been a uh, it's been really really good for me the last year and a half um you know so who doesn't love a swedged harpoon warncliffe Right. <laughs> right. I mean, uh, yeah, it's a cool, it's a very cool looking blade. Um, and, and on your Instagram page, uh, you, you can see all the different handles and stuff and the different ways you, um, I was going to say handle the knife, but it, it, all the yeah. different ways you treat it. Um, it's, it's a really cool one. And, and I think, uh, you know, people love Warren cliffs. They just yeah. love the utility. Yeah, absolutely. And they're just, they're cool. <laughs> they're yeah, cool they and are. they're aggressive and, you know, and they, they cut like a son of a gun. So yeah. And you can't there's... help but feel a little bit like a, um, a Viking because they always remind me of a sax, like a good yeah. old fashioned sax. Uh, I want to talk a little bit to you about the business of this because uh, eight and a half years ago, you went full time and, uh, and you've mentioned your life has changed uh, in that period. Um, what has the business of knives been like for you? Let me see. So it's certainly not the easiest way to go about making a living. Um, that's for sure. It's the hardest thing I've ever done uh, as far as just continually like, you know, maintaining cash flow. And uh, I am still such a show centric business because I, my internet profile never really hit. Uh, still hasn't to this day, you know, I've spent the last 
six years trying to cobble together the, you know, 1900 or so odd followers on Instagram that I have. And uh, what that meant was I had to get in front of people and I had to, to sell myself as a maker and, and I had to sell my product, which is why I'm still, you know, I'm on the road just about 25 weekends a year. Wow. Um, I'm basically every other weekend I'm somewhere. Um, 20 to 25 shows a year, you know, obviously there are a few big shows like New York, Nashville blade show, uh, that I need to spend a little extra time preparing for. Um, and so that might take, you know, one of my local shows out of rotation so that I can make sure that I, you know, stuff for the big stuff. Um, but I'm still just out there, pardon the pun, but grinding. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, that's, that's, uh, that's a cool, well, that's kind of an old school way. Yeah. And I like it. I, I appreciate that. And I think uh, a lot of people appreciate that meeting custom knife makers face to face. And uh, part of that uh, is because we like to meet the person who's making these things right. that we love, but also, um, you know, they're not inexpensive. And right. so when you're, when you're handing over your money to someone for something that you probably might not need, uh, no, let's face it. No one needs to customize. Right? Certainly <laughs> I don't, you know, yeah. Right. but, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's part of the experience to, to meet the maker and, and find out, um, yeah. you know, where they come from and, and you know, where they're coming from. Well, and that, that kind of, you know, comes back around to the salesmanship thing I was talking about. Um, you know, like a, a large, but I wouldn't say majority, but, a a, a huge proportion or you know uh of my sales are to not necessarily knife people you know it's literally just someone that stumbled across me at a gun show or a, an arts and craft show and i've you know convinced them that they need this thing in their life um and i think a lot of that comes from you know interacting with me and hearing my story and you know my enthusiasm for what it is i'm doing which is 100 percent genuine like i'm still absolutely just I love what I do and, uh, you know, just hope to continue to do it. And once again, that means just getting out there every other weekend and doing my thing. That's what it means. Um, I don't think, I don't think that'll ever stop. Like I, I, I very, very much enjoy the in-person interaction, you know, even if it's a slower show, you know, it's just having people like appreciate my work kind of going back to that, that, enthusiasm i felt when i first started out when i was making these really you know crappy knives and people were still like oh wow man that's like super cool and like yeah. it just it filled me with like a sense of like joy and accomplishment and you know now that i'm actually doing stuff that even knife people appreciate you know and i've i've gotten good enough where you know i'm, I'm sitting here talking to you right now like that's to me that's still mind-blowing like i you know i it, it's been a long time, but at the same time, I just kind of blinked and I like looked up and all of a sudden, you know, I'm doing like yeah. decent work, you know, and there wasn't like a whole lot of reflection in the meantime, if that makes sense. You know, it's not like I was like gauging my progress year right. by year. Plotting going, your okay. course and yeah. So like now the fact that, you know, I'm, somehow people you know appreciate me and you know like the fact that you're you know inviting me on your show like that that's still kind of mind-blowing to me you know i'm like oh wow like you can make pretty good knives <laughs> you know and it's still like i don't i don't think of myself that way you know what i mean i'm just yeah. like a guy out there trying to do cool stuff and like i said i do so many like local stuff like it's just having people stop by and tell me, even if they don't buy something, like having them stop by and, and handle something and being like, Hey, I don't have, you know, four or $500 for a, a knife today, but man, just, you're doing amazing stuff. And you're, you know, in this group of quote unquote craftsmen at this arts and craft show, you're by far the most talented, you know, here when it comes to like actual skill involved in what it is you're creating. And don't get me wrong. That's not always the case. There are, you know, I, I find myself, amongst you know really talented painters and you know carpenters and stuff like that as well but you know you also have like people selling candles yeah. and like you know when people walk from that tent into mine they're like their mind is like absolutely blown <laughs> and that, that no, i'm sorry yeah and that, and that feels thank really good thank god there are no candles here and all i yeah. see are these cool blades 
Yeah, you know, and so that's still like that that fuels the passion and it fuels the the drive, you know, and, and kind of keeps me going. Like I said, even if it's a obviously I, I want to make money at every show I'm at. Sure. That is the goal. Um, but at the same time, just it's never totally bad, you know, because people are appreciating what I'm doing and like that just it feels really good. Let me let me ask you this. This is a, actually a pretty valuable you are a valuable resource in the moment because uh, a lot of the knife makers I talk to uh, rely on um, do rely on Instagram and other places like uh, that yes. to, to sell. And that's great. Instagram has been a boon for for most knife makers. Uh, but for you who goes to so many shows, um, yeah. I I. I only go to blade show pretty much. I, I'd like to expand that as we go, but I've noticed there are some people who draw you in and, and others that might make beautiful work. But so tell me, what are the rules or give, give me some idea of the rules that knife makers might want to follow for an engaging, a good show. You know? uh, I'm, yeah. I mean, it, it's maybe, you know, like I obviously don't, sit at your table and like look at your phone um like no one wants to come and interact with you if you're not interacting back you know i i think i've always the irony is that you know knife making is such a uh, solitary you know career um and i am by nature a people person i've always been hyper friendly i love people i love interacting with people you know it's not it's not forced for me i'm not like an introvert that like needs to turn it on you know, yeah. so like, just kind of like, <sighs> I hate to be like, well, just be yourself, man. Cause that sounds so like freaking cliche. And, you know, I just, maybe I was blessed with an engaging personality. I don't know. Like, and you know, you feed me a little caffeine and then a little bit of, you know, getting high on my own supply of people telling me my work is cool. And next thing you know, I'm fucking, oh, excuse me, sorry about the language, That's okay. but I'm, I'm, you know, just wild eyed and, and, you know, excited. And I'm, like I said, if you walk by my table and like make eye contact, you're getting talked to, you don't even have to respond. Yeah. <laughs> you can walk away, but I'm going to, I'm like, I'm going to yell at you as you're walking away. Not, you know, yeah, negatively, yeah. but it's like, Hey, where are you going? You know, like, yeah, come on down. Yeah. You can stop for five minutes. Let's go. Come on. Get to talk to me. And I, I uh, love that. I, you yeah. gotta be engaging like that. Yeah. And I, it, it comes relatively natural to me. And yeah. so, you know, it's like, like ground rules obviously don't be like mean looking you know and i'm like you know six one 230 pound tattooed guy you know but like i have a smile on my face and right, right. you know i'm i'm speaking maybe loudly but pleasantly you know and yeah. so for me it's just like you know just be yourself and be fun i don't know like <laughs> i know it's, it might be hard for some people to hear like hey what's wrong with you just be fun for the love yeah, of yeah, God. yeah you know just like be, be more fun what's wrong with you you know like if you can't muster fun i get it uh, something i uh, um uh that people have used that's very effective uh that they they seem like they might not be that comfortable but it works it is you can pick up anything you want you know you walk by like what are you going to say? No, you're a knife guy. There's there's going to be one thing on that table that's yep. interesting to you. You pick it up and then you start a conversation. And uh, yeah, I, I think it, man. I, I like that. I, I I mean, it's very cool to to hear that you go to to half a year. Weekends a year are spent at these places. Just about. Uh, and, yeah. And you're selling to knife freaks and then to people who are, are just like so excited yep. to see that there's a knife yeah and then yeah. and, and might not know like anything about custom knives in which case like don't get me wrong like you can there is a like I, i've certainly chased more than a few people off you know because they'll go down some avenue regarding you know metallurgy or, mm -hmm. or something and or especially damascus making because that is like kind of my thing yeah. um and you know they they ask about how the process or how what the process is and so i i, I begin explaining and you know 15 minutes later their eyes glaze over <laughs> roll in the back of their head and they just like step slowly away and shift to the side you know so it doesn't <laughs> doesn't always work but uh you know overall yeah man just yeah being enthused about what you're doing, man. Like, I think that's, that's just the, the biggest key, you know? So as we close here, where, where do you want to see mag 10 knife works in the future? What, what do you want to see the company grow into? Uh, you know, I, I not entirely sure right now. I know that sounds like, and 
knife makers are notoriously bad businessmen, um, which I think is a pretty well-known fact that I'm not like spilling the beans on, you know? <laughs> um, so for me, it's, you know, it's so much just like, Hey, you've got a show next weekend and you got to get stuff done, you know? So while like now I'm thinking, I, I'd like to do maybe some, I don't want to say production stuff, but maybe, you know, bring online maybe a version of my EDP and EDW that is a little bit less labor intensive for me. Cause like right now I'm working, you know, 60 hours a week uh, as I have been for like years, just trying to get stuff done. So raising, raising my profile to a point where it's a little bit, you know, easier to have, you know, some more production based stuff that just kind of goes mm -hmm. and I don't have to, you know, I don't have to try so hard which I know that sounds weird. Like I'm always going to try really hard, but like where, you know, it just, it gets a little easier because like right now it's, it's, it's not, like I said, it's not the easiest way to go about doing things. And uh, like right now, everything, I don't have anything water jet cut. It's like all done 100% by hand by me. And it's, it's kind of exhausting. Um, so maybe that, and definitely just getting better at what I do. You know, I, I, I'm incredibly excited like right now because I'm I've never not been excited about my work, but I'm getting better and I'm more able to like fully realize these visions I have. And that's exciting to be able to have a a, a mind's eye vision of something that's not necessarily like tame, you know, is a little bit wild and kind of have the confidence to to bring it to fruition in three dimensions like that's exciting for me and so just doing more of that wilder and wilder stuff uh i definitely like to do more folder work um i'm make handmade slip joints now um but getting more into the the locking stuff you know uh you know the liner locks and, and frame locks and uh just allowing myself to explore my creativity in that direction um, like, obviously there's like market share there and everyone's like, oh, of course the folder market will always be hot. Mm -hmm. But my desire to get more into that side of things uh, is not necessarily driven just by like financial, uh, you know, drive. Well, they're cool. <laughs> yeah, they're cool. And I, and I want to put my spin on, you know, some of that stuff. And for me, that means just doing what I'm doing now, but, you know, in, in a folder, uh, I'd also really like to start getting it I'd, I'd like to nail down stainless damascus um that's huge on my list right now um i've been saying that for the last year and a half so you know i say huge on my list but the the realities of the day-to-day -day business of things and once again there's like always a show around the corner like for me it's like every other weekend and so it's kind of hard to spend r d time you know, just like playing with stuff. Like I have a lot of leeway in that I can be like, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to do this more artsy fartsy knife this week because I need to get it out of my mind. Like it's been haunting me. And if I don't, if I don't manifest this object into reality, I'm not going to be able to stop thinking about it until I do. And, you know, I've got enough inventory for the next show. So let me do something wild. Um, that, that Persian I showed you earlier would be a, a good example of that type of knife. Um, but yeah, doing, doing more of that stuff and, the stainless Damascus is kind of a, a personal goal. Uh, not, and I mean, I do make Damascus for other makers now. Like I, I do have a client list of, you know, people who use my billets and like, I don't know if the stainless thing is viable on a business aspect. Cause you have guys like Chad Nichols out there and Vegas forge and these people, and obviously Dana Steele, you know, doing just unbelievable work with, you know, uh, on a massive scale. And uh, like, I don't know if as a one man shop, Although I'd, I'd like to grow, you know, yeah. beyond that, but you know, yeah, maybe that's, that's something too, is, you know, getting more of the Damascus side of the business going. Cause I'm, I very much enjoy making steel and uh, you know, I enjoy the fact that people are willing to, to buy my steel off of too. So, but yeah. Well, well, we'll keep our eyes open and actually you and I are going to talk more uh, about this kind of stuff and some of this stuff in particular in our Patreon extra uh, interview, which we'll do. If you want to listen to that, of course, you have to become a patron. Um, Colin McGuire of Magnet Knife Works. Thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie Boss. It was really nice meeting you and talking with you. Uh, pleasure was all mine, my friend. All righty, sir. Take care. You as well.
There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Colin McGuire of Mag Ten Knifeworks. Uh, uh, listen to him. Avoid his uh, avoid his um, website, but definitely check out his Instagram. Uh, he's got r many, many beautiful pictures of his gorgeous knives. Uh, like we were talking about, his EDW slash EDP uh, line is just really cool and then all the other stuff he does uh so be sure to go check that out also check us out again next week for another great interview wednesday for the midweek supplemental and thursday for thursday night knives for jim working his magic behind the switcher i'm bob demarco saying until next time don't take dull for an answer thanks for listening to the knife junkie podcast if you enjoyed the show please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com for show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.